Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. In 2008, we had the good fortune to host Lucille Clifton at the library over the course of an entire day. So when I learned that New York Review Books was re-releasing her memoir, Generations, with an introduction by Tracy K. Smith, I jumped at the opportunity to host an event. For those of you who don't know Clifton's work, she spent her career chronicling the African-American female experience and family life through 14 celebrated books of poetry. Her collection, Blessing the Boats, won the National Book Award, and I believe she is still the only author ever to have two books of poetry nominated in the same year for the Pulitzer Prize. Clifton was awarded the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize and the Robert Frost Medal for Lifetime Achievement. She also wrote many books for children and served as the Poet Laureate of Maryland. Continuing the Laureate theme, we're joined tonight by Tracy K. Smith, a former two-term US Poet Laureate and Professor of English and African and African-American Studies at Harvard University. She is also a Chancellor of the American Academy of Poets and the author of five books of verse, including the Pulitzer Prize winning Life on Mars, as well as the memoir Ordinary Light and her most recent volume, Such Color. She'll be in conversation with Trapita B. Mason, Philadelphia Poet Laureate, and the author of She Was Once Herself and Mocha Melodies. Tracy, Trapita, thank you for joining us. The screen is yours. Thank you for having us, Andy. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And Tracy, I'm honored. It's a pleasure to meet you. This is actually our second meeting. A few years back, um, when we were still gathering in person a lot more, uh, I attended a reading of your poetry book at the Free Library of Philadelphia, Wade in the Water. I, I actually, um, one of the poems, your the title poem, Wade in the Water, uh, is one of my favorites about love, love, love. Just a beautiful poem. Oh, um, a kind friend gave me an invitation to attend a pre-reading dinner with you, and you were so gracious and generous with your time. Um, you're a writer who are, you're quite busy, but yet you're so accessible to many of us, both through your work and your willingness to share poetry in so many forms uh, with the public. So I wanna congratulate you on your many accomplishments and thank you for your stewardship of this great art form. Oh, that's so kind of you. Thank <laughs> you. And thank you for your amazing stewardship of, of poetry. Um, and the role that you're in as Philadelphia's Poet Laureate. Um, and also just the, the work that you do. I've read your writing on Clifton and I feel like I've um, gained new insight into her through that. And so it's exciting mm -hmm. that in some ways we're building a big thing together. That's what I think yes. we're doing. I was just thinking that I said, you know, we're meeting again. We're gonna have a sisterly conversation about our beloved Lucille Clifton. And I say our, because so many of us claim her, right? And so many of us need her. And mm -hmm. my hope that in the next hour will allow us to not only discuss the, this memoir, um, Generations, um, and this rich themes, but also celebrate our love of Sister Lucille. So tonight, Tracy and I will discuss the themes in Generations, the memoir, and we're gonna share through our discussion lines and passages to highlight uh, the Great Life of Lucille Clifton and, the, and this memoir of her family. But to begin, uh, Tracy's going to read the introductions to Generation, and then we're going to share that now. Okay. I guess I'll, maybe I'll just preface this by saying, um, you know, the honor uh, and the opportunity to, to provide an introduction to, to Clifton's work it was um, so huge and wonderful. And then I realized, oh my goodness, there are so many ways that this book can be framed. Mm -hmm. um, what do I want to, <laughs> what path do I want to carve in? And so this is what came to me. Beautiful. What is our relationship to history? Do we belong to it or is it ours? Are we in it? Does it run through us spilling out like blood? sorry, spilling out like water or blood? I think the answers to those questions, at least in America, depend upon who you are, or rather on who you've been taught to believe that you are. If the history you descend from has been mapped, adapted, mythologized, reenacted, and broadcast 
as though it is the central defining story of a continent. Perhaps you can be forgiven up to a point for having succumbed to a collective distortion. But what if yours is a history the wider world once recorded, not as lives and feats, but as articles of inventory? Men, women, children, listed according to their age and value as property. What if the largeness of those lives, what they endured, yes, but also what they carried, remembered, witnessed, and made has been hushed up, negated, overwritten, or outright erased? What if the recovery of your full story sheds stark light on the lie of that other louder story? There it is, light. It took three paragraphs to creep in as a metaphor, though it runs through the work of Lucille Clifton like life force. Mm -hmm. Light comes to her, light speaks, light emanates from the figures of history and myth, like Lucifer, God's bringer of light, whom Clifton claims as her namesake and who in her rendering testifies, illuminate I could, and so, illuminate, I did. Mm. If light is what the work of Clifton is intent upon spreading, then I'm tempted to think that history, as we have been conditioned to accept it, is unrefracted, all of a piece, and blindingly white. Whereas Clifton's imagination is prismatic. It slows down the central story so we can see what it is truly made of all the dazzling colors moving at different frequencies and, depending upon circumstances, in distinct directions. In generations, her poetically terse and emotionally epic prose memoir, first published in 1976, Clifton uses the occasion of her father's funeral to attest to the lives lived and the marks made by the generations of people she descends from. First, they are names, dates, and places, like Caroline Donald, Mammy Caroline, born free among the Dahomey people in 1822 and died free in Bedford, Virginia in 1910. To reinscribe these lives into recollected history is to restore history itself to a rightful state of commotion. Once named, these kin arrive not singly but en masse, brought to life through the rhythm and inflection of voices, like the voice of Clifton's own father, Sam Sales, in whose vernacular rhythm Mammy Caroline is not merely described but rather conjured. This is his voice. Oh, she was tall and skinny and walked straight as a soldier, Lou, straight like somebody marching wherever she went. And she talked with an Oxford accent. I ain't kidding. Don't let nobody tell you them old people was dumb. She talked like she was from London, England. And when we kids would be running and hooping and hollering all around, she would come to the door and look straight at me and shake her finger and say, stop that bedlam, mister. Stop that bedlam, I say with an Oxford accent, Lou. She was a dark, old, skinny lady, and she raised my daddy and then raised me, at least till I was eight years old when she died. I hear in Sales' his O's and his Lou's and his exclamations and his insistence, something that is not simply expressive, but exultant and positively oracular. He is engaged not simply in an act of telling, but of creating and consecrating a capacity for belief and understanding in both his daughter and, if we're listening properly, his daughter's readers. The passage above segues seamlessly into the following capacity expanding moment when Clifton's father signifies upon how, at eight years of age, Mammy Caroline walked, from New walked north from New Orleans to Virginia in 1830, at which point she was sold away from her family. And this is um, Sam Sales again. I remember everything she ever told me. Cause you know, when you're that age, you old enough to remember things. I remember everything she told me, Lou, even though she died when I was eight years old. 
And then I know about what she remembered because that's how old she was when she got here, eight years old. Mammy Caroline's depth of feeling, knowledge and loss. In other words, the reality of her personhood both affirmed and was affirmed by the reality of young Sam Sales's selfhood. As a child in grief, he found depth of feeling and knowledge or generated it through belief in what Mammy Caroline in her own grief would have been required to find or generate. These are the lives that America's dominant history as defined by aspirational, aspirational notions of white personhood has let fall into shadow. These are the stories that have been left unmarked and untended by America's preferred view of itself, like the graves of slaves on land passed down through the white generations. One of the major contributions of Clifton's writing is that she has teased out these lives, allowing them to demand their rightful space, to command our full attention, to teach us things about themselves and ourselves. But it is not enough only to tease out, to separate and disband. Clifton's purpose is to teach us to see what we are in fact moving together and what we are in fact, sorry, that we are moving together and that we are in fact part of a large whole. And that whole is unified. Unity is not what we have been taught to believe. It is not compliance, not assimilation, not an enforced hierarchy. Neither is it simply escape. What then is the vision of America that Clifton is intent upon illuminating? When you arrange one prism next to another, all those different colors, red, orange, yellow, and so on, rejoin one another. And together, they begin to move in another direction. There's one more thing I want to ask you to consider as you lose and perhaps find yourself in the generations of Clifton's family. I take as significant the fact that Walt Whitman's voice is invoked alongside the everyday poetry taken from the mouths of Clifton's ancestors. In this context, Whitman's Song of Myself is no longer a familiar American music but an invitation to a radical reconfiguring of self. In other words, when Whitman's, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, is sat beneath a portrait of Clifton's grandfather and great grandmother. What I am made to understand is this, here in America and perhaps everywhere, no matter who we have been made to believe that we are, we are, all of us, the children of slaves. How lovely. How lovely. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to begin by saying um, this is lovely. And to be able to just lay out the, the themes that are covered, uh, in this uh, wonderful memoir. So in Generations, Lucille Clifton ponders um, um, if some of the stories she's heard about her own family are true, particularly of Lucy, uh, the great grandmother that her father tells her was hanged for killing a white man. And in page uh, 38 to 39, she writes, um, later I would ask my father for proof. Where are the records, daddy, I would ask, the time may not be right, and it may be, it may just be a family legend or something. Somebody somewhere knows, he would say, and I would be dissatisfied and fuss with Fred about fact and proof and history until he told me one day not to worry that even the lies are true. In history, even the lies are true. Mm -hmm. So Tracy, you began your introduction by asking, what is our relationship to history? Do we belong to it or is it ours? Does it run through us spilling like water of blood? So powerful. Let's, so let's talk about that. What is our, what do you feel our relationship with history in context of this story um, or just in general? Um, and I love this idea of spilling like water or blood. 
Well, you know, this, this story um, uh, makes me aware of the different relationships that each of us has, right? And so one is um, what we imagine is collective, what's shaped by the central story. Um, and I believe in America, it's a central white story, um, mm -hmm. a story that centers whiteness. Um, and that, you know, necessarily has to downplay some of the things that, that um, call whiteness into, into question. Um, I think that that allegiance to what is official is what made, you know, young Lucille Clifton say, are, are there facts that can be corroborated from this mm. the story you're telling me? Is this real? Did this happen? And in some ways, that question is not just a symptom of, you know, th the notion that there is one history and that it descends from above, but also it, it reveals how much, um, how much the quiet, the undocumented and the lived history of black people in this country has been um, discounted, you know, mm -hmm. has been um, cast as inaccurate, as overly subjective as if history itself, any account isn't subjective. Yes. Um, and so I love that part of the work of this book is to honor these stories that she has had been hearing her whole life and also to say, not only are they real for me, but if you listen, they, um, they allow us to understand how all of these other stories fit together. And if you're willing to take the risk of having something um, recalibrated, <laughs> um, then you can get a better sense of what we belong to, what we've made, damaged, protected, rebuilt. Um, and, and been marked by. And, and that's a big gift, I think. And I agree. In poetry, she also often, you know, justice is important to her. Black lives are of immense importance to her. But there's this vision of after that she also casts in which all of us are somehow accountable to mm -hmm. something bigger than what is human. Mm -hmm. And it's a glorious and terrifying position. You know, there's there's a poem of hers um, that ends where we're being asked, why ever did you do this to one another? Why did you do this mm -hmm. to yourselves? Mm -hmm. And the poem ends with us humans saying, because, because, because. because. Um, this book helps us to think of other forms of mm -hmm. um, sense making, you know? Yes. Yeah, and this whole idea of do we belong to it or is it ours? And in the telling of the stories of her family in this um, this rich way of telling the story, this is a question that we ponder even as writers. These stories that we tell, does it belong to us? Um, is it ours <laughs> or is it something? Because she's really exposing a lot here. Um, there's the history uh, and then there are also these intimate family stories. She talks about her mother and father, you know, about their intimate relations or not. And um, yeah. sometimes I wonder as a writer and the things that we choose to keep and the things that we choose to expose um, and this whole idea, this question you asked in the beginning, who does it really belong to? Is it ours to tell these stories? Mm -hmm. so, so what are your thoughts on that? Hmm. I think that we live with the feeling that they're ours, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the idea, you know, this refrain in, in Clifton's life, you, you come from Dahomey women, you, you mm -hmm. take what you need, you get what you want. Mm -hmm. um, that helped her, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that the death of, of her father also allowed her to understand that there's something that we, we also owe to those lives Mm -hmm. There's something that we owe to one another um, and that we're stewards of something. We're not just beneficiaries of a history and a sense of, um, you know, either lineage or, or endurance or capacity. Right. Um, we must tend to this thing that is not yet finished being made. Mm -hmm. And so, the tending is the telling also, yeah, yeah. right? The telling of it. And I and so that leads me to um, I love how you describe in your introduction how Clifton introduced us to her kin, her her family, not individually, but I love the in mass 
it's almost felt like we were just bombarded, or I like to say pleasantly overwhelmed by all of these characters, their lives, the language, the stories, the color, just so brilliantly rendered, um, so poetic. So I wanted to talk about ancestry and archiving, memory and storytelling. Mm -hmm. What is critical for you in the telling and where do you start? And what do you think motivated Clifton? Uh, what do you think motivates her in the telling of the story? The Dahomey woman, of course, was one major theme that ran through um, this story. Um, and and it, it, I, I couldn't really decide if what, whether she was placing more emphasis on value on one more than others. But um, there was this, this, this continuation, this buildup about this to homey women. Mm -hmm. And so let's just talk about what's critical in, in storytelling and particularly for, uh, for you as well as for what you picked up from uh, Lucille Clifton. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that we get um, snatches of the voices of different mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and hearing her, fan hearing, hearing her father's voice and even hearing, you know, the, um, the, the great great grandmother um, and, and how she was described it I said in my introduction there's that commotion it brings the sense of you know what I like to think of as the breath which maybe is my way of saying a not unspent set of energies and wishes needs and a kind of life force mm. Um, so that feels big to me. It feels big also that um, the way we, and I'm going to put myself in the we of her family in a way, <laughs> the ways that we have used English as a container for our feelings and experiences, the, mm -hmm. the vernacular that runs through, you know, Black Southern voices and, mm -hmm. and all the different ways that they, they change regionally and, and generationally, that feels like a kind of philosophy to me, mm -hmm. you know, and there's some lines that, that you and I have talked about, like um, you, you mentioned, even the lies are true or, yes, yes. you know, there's a moment where um, her great aunt says, um, it's not over or she's told slavery was a terrible thing, mm -hmm. but it was only ever temporary. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not the way that one would naturally think about the condition of, for some people, lifelong enslavement, but the, the containers that we make to tell ourselves who we are and who we will be, even if we aren't around to be alive in that we, mm -hmm. um, it feels oracular to me. It feels world creating. It instantly recalibrates the scale, not only of what we're enduring. So that, that notion that slavery was only ever temporary makes this uncatalogable kind of um, suffering, small in the face of something else that black life is about, that's vast, yes. you know, yes. and that feels miraculous to me. Yes. Um, and, um, oh, there's a lot. It's the voices it's that a do lot. a lot for me. It's mm -hmm. also, you know, and she, she lists these generations and it's like a prayer you know, naming Mammy Caroline, naming the Lucy, naming Sam, naming all of the, the descendants down to herself. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I think a way of, of um, cementing the reality of these lives, right? It's, an, and that's done several times. I think at least twice, there's the, there's this naming. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like a conjuring. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, I found myself repeating these names, and I almost felt like this is how she was doing her praise or her, mm -hmm. as a you know, a conjuring, giving prayer, giving praise. It just felt more than just um, words on the page. Yeah, it wasn't um, just historical, right? Yeah, yes, it wasn't just yeah. the facts and the timeline. It was you're right, like a, a calling down into the into the body. Mm -hmm. Be here with me. In, in the way the prayer works, yeah, right? Yeah. Two more gathered together, something something descends. Yeah, um, it felt very, it felt necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads me to, I think you kind of touched on this about the balance and the light in her work. Um, you had mentioned it a little bit. There's a passage about Aunt Lucille, the woman that she's named after, 
you know, on page 65. And audience members, we are definitely going to get to your questions. Um, but we have a couple of nuggets that we wanted to share with you this evening. Um, so on page 65, as they are putting uh, Fred uh, into, you know, father, I'm sorry, her father's funeral, mm -hmm. Aunt Lucille, uh, she says, Aunt Lucille was shaking my arm and crying, crying without shame, quietly and straight as a soldier. Mammy, Mammy, she was whispering in her tears. Mammy, it's 1969 and we're still here. I held her hand tightly, Lucille and Lucille. My father bumped against the earth like a rock. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 1969 and we're still here. It's 2021 and we're still here. Mm -hmm. You know, the balance um, just in her work. So let, let's talk about uh, Lucille Clifton. And uh, I think you and I shared this uh, conversation briefly, but I also saw it in the introduction, um, this, this idea of light, hope. Um, and I think as we're talking about storytelling and, and generations and memoir and that prayer and conjuring we mentioned earlier, um, and there's the struggle, which you're going to get to with the passage that you're going to read, but there are so many light moments here, um, very light moments. The father, uh, you know, brought tears to my eyes when he wrote her a letter when she went to Howard University. And the dad could not really write and the mother writing her back to say, he spent all day reading, writing this letter for you. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is the greatest thing I've read my whole life. The greatest mm -hmm. thing I'll ever read were those three lines from her father. Talk about light and hope mm -hmm. uh, in, in Clifton's work. Yeah, I mean, it's a source of uh, casting out the, the doubt mm -hmm. right even in the biblical sense mm -hmm. and casting out at even just momentarily the the sense of trouble in this book the sense of trouble that brings all of this into play is the death of her father mm -hmm. and even you know it, there's laughter yes. in the gathering they laugh on their way. It's actually such a beautiful entry into the, the journey to the funeral. They're laughing on the road. Um, there, there's a moment where she and her husband and um, siblings are being followed by a, a cowboy who's yes. up on the bumper of their car. And, yes. you know, if we saw this in a movie, we'd say, oh, no, there's going to be some racial tension here. Mm -hmm. well, I'm scared. No, they laugh. They laugh at the cowboy and scare him oh, you know, off the road in a way, in a joyful, yes. mirthful way. And I think that's a really interesting reversal of something that we have um, um, kind of like internalized the perception of, of Black life as fraught by risk and danger and, and constrained by that. Yes. The light here says we're big, we're full of, mm -hmm. of mirth and life-giving um, energy and, 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 and hope, freedom. Yes. Um, that, that feels huge. And it doesn't doesn't outshine the presence of other elements, but it it um it does a powerful kind of count, counterbalancing work. It makes it really does. It, it really does. I especially love it when she would when she spoke about the woman. You know, as they were first of all, she talked about Pennsylvania a lot because I was laughing because I'm in Philadelphia and their whole sense of Pennsylvania is not really a, a fond yeah. one. <laughs> but she spoke about the woman who wanted her, you know, hey, we, we're not those types of Blacks here. And, you know, she didn't say it, but in her presence, in her look, she was silencing their joy and she was not going to have that, mm -hmm. you know, um, they were not going to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, past, a page you had mentioned and we were talking about this whole uh, slavery and, the, you know, just throughout her story, we're talking about the, the, the homie women, we're talking about this also a legacy of slavery and then you mentioned in the introduction and talk about Whitman's poems that's kind of throughout this uh, memoir so can you uh why don't you maybe we talk share a little bit about that passage and let's just talk about what you were thinking about when you highlighted that yeah sure will you give me the help me out with the page number yes uh 27 28 okay, okay. 
Um, so this is one of the stories. I'm gonna just read maybe a half of this paragraph. One of the stories that, that she grew up hearing. Um, Uncle Lewis had been given to, so Lucille Sale was um, a young, strong, beautiful, proud woman. Mm -hmm. um, and one day when she had got big, she was in the field and a carriage come by and stopped and two old men was in it. It was Uncle Lewis Sale and he was a slave, but he was too old to work in the field. And so his job was to drive his master in the carriage. His master was old man, John F. Sale, and he was an old man too, Lou, and blind. Uncle Lewis had been given to his family as a boy. He was a present to their family. He was somebody and he was a present, a wedding present, Lou. And he was driving this carriage, an old man driving another old man, and he saw Caline in the orchard. And he stopped the horses and asked old man John F. to buy her for him, for his wife. And old man John F. did. She was a young lady by then, Lou. And Uncle Lewis had been born in 1777, but she was bought and went off to the sale place. And old man John F. married them legal because he was a lawyer, and they always said he was a good man. She lived there on the sale place and they trained her to be a midwife and Mammy Caroline and Uncle Lewis had seven or more children. Lou. And one of the first ones was a girl. They called her Lucy, but her name was Luc Lucille, like my own sister and like you. Oh, slavery, slavery, my daddy would say. It ain't something in a book, Lou. Even the good parts was awful. Um, I feel like that's such a, an important moment because it, it's full of all these, what I think of as just conundrums, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that this, this man, this somebody, and that, that, you, that somebody is important also in, in Clifton's poetry, that, that phrase, you, you are somebody, is something that, that is inside of her. But uh, he's reduced to a gift, a, a wedding gift, and given to another man, another man his own age, um, and this young woman was married to this old man without agency, and yet they created something. They, they made space for other generations to come through. Um, I feel like it sheds light on the, not only the cruelty of the institution, which we're used to, but the preposterousness of it, mm -hmm. you know, the many um, contradictions um, to peers, but one is considered to be the owner of another. One is considered property. Um, and a woman who's strong in her bearing and strong enough to, you know, um, to make these, this powerful mark on time and space um, reduced to a, essentially a gift to this other, <laughs> to this other person. Um, with no choices, right? Yeah, no, I mean, we know yeah. that, but there's yeah. something about the way that it's distilled into a little paragraph that fits into her father's mouth, mm -hmm. that's full of facts and dates and relationships. It's almost like a little work of theater. Yes. And when you're given this, when history is um, familiar, when it it's something you can see played out dramatically, and when the mm -hmm. facts and the data, it, it becomes something else. It becomes... I don't know, a form of evidence. Mm -hmm. It becomes, um, I don't know, an alternate doctrine in a way. Yes. And that felt, it felt helpful to me. And I feel like um, there's even a way that the wish for proof that, that Clifton asked her father for, are there dates? Is this written down? That was familiar to me, that feeling of, can I trust this as not just wishful, um, and so to receive this story many, many times over mm -hmm. and all of these remembered, you know, moments uh, of listening to her father and to have it pieced back together, even to have the images of this, the, this kin, um, it felt like, it felt like I was finding something for me. Mm -hmm. It felt like my doubts, my anxieties that, you know, the paper trail mu must end therefore do we exist, those things that maybe others live with, like I feel like I have, that was dispelled somehow. Mm -hmm. I think that was a, one of the, the gifts that I encountered reading this book as a black person. Mm -hmm. And I imagine the other gift 
that would come from reading this book as a white person or someone who's not black would be to see the same dramatic situation played mm -hmm. out and say, my people are here and the reality of their dominion um, is changed for me. Right. Maybe that is also a way of enlarging rather than diminishing something. Right. Right. And uh, I, 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 I find that is so awesome a way to think about that because what, what we're really asking is when you enter into these stories is to be able to see just as much as effort as uh, Lucille Clifton putting into making her family lives so big, mm -hmm. so colorful, so large, is to also see yourself as the reader in that larger story, you know, and to place yourself there. And I, I wonder about the storyteller, uh, her father, mm -hmm. it's complicated, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, we have this gift of all these stories that he told, and I for I I was going along for the ride, and I I believe you know I believe them. <laughs> I know that she young was still asked for proof, uh, but you know I believe all these stories. But there's also a complication, you know, complicated telling of the story. Um, she lays everything to bear. We're able to see it. And for me, I'm curious for you, what did you, what did you kind of want to take away from the storyteller, the father? Mm. Um, you know, I, I saw, it kind of reminds I saw him as a whole person and I was okay with the complications. Mm -hmm. And for a part of me was really intent with no judgment. I was grateful for the stories. But especially, you know, when the mother, uh, there's a line in there when the mother said several times, I'm, I'm just tired, Lucille, I'm just tired. Mm -hmm. And you just imagine as a woman, as a black woman, all the things, the years with no intimacy, but then here are these brilliant stories coming from this father. So what did you choose to, where did you place the dad in the storytelling, the father? Well, I was really grateful for the gift of what he, what he transmitted. Mm -hmm. But I was also grateful for the, the courage that Clifton had to mm -hmm. also say, this is a man who had lots of women. This is a man who, you know, disappeared sometimes. And then there's also a very um, quiet form of discretion that she exercises in that book where she says, it wasn't all good times. Mm -hmm. There were some things that were not good that happened in that house and that that man did. Yes. Um, and we, we understand a little bit of that sometimes from her poetry. There's a lot of darkness in yeah. family. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yet it becomes part of this really complicated, um, large story. Um, and to think that, that hurts in a way that it, it should hurt. Yes. Right? Recovering all of this doesn't fix everything else it just adds to the fabric in a way and there's a lot of ache you know the mother suffers the the siblings you know there there's addiction there's you know the sense of of lostness mm -hmm. even among the the siblings as they're going to, back to the funeral that doesn't go away mm -hmm. um but this book is about these other things that can be helpful to that if we let them. Agreed. And um, it's, a, it's a small book. Uh, it's a quick read, but not really because that's deceptive because you're going over, <laughs> over these stories over, mm -hmm. I've read it a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that it's a celebration. And I, and I think my last question is gonna, or comment, I should say, she center around uh, Lucille Clifton, because we have a couple of questions in the chat for, for you. And um, as you know, that one poem that we think about, um, won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life, right? Uh, I think you read somewhere how that poem for me is, uh, you know, it's like a mantra. Um, but I'm, I read the poem in between reading the generations and reading the book. Mm -hmm. And that's the line that resonated with me, what I have shaped into a kind of life. I had no model. 
you know, um, and the, you know, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? So all, I was thinking about her arriving at Howard with the suitcase, with the makeshift rope around it, and how people perceived her, her see-through blouse and, you know, not, not a fashionable outfits. And all the times when she was disregarded and, and not treated, you know, according to the stature of who she is, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I think about her poem. And it makes sense, right? So celebrate this life with me that I've chosen to, to make into something, mm -hmm. right? So what, what resonates with you with, with that poem? And I'm selfish here, Tracy, because that's one of my favorite poems. And, and, yeah. I, and I don't want to lose this. I don't want to have this opportunity to talk about Lucille Clifton without speaking okay. about that. You, you recited so much of it, but is it okay if I just read it? Of course. Well? Yes. Maybe not everybody knows it. Yes, um, I really love that. And um, yeah, it's, it's one of her iconic poems. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. Hold my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has, and has failed. failed. And has failed. Mm -hmm. I mean, this poem mm -hmm. sits on just about every plane of existence that we can really consider, oh, right? Yeah. I mean, if we're thinking about history, that every day becomes something mm -hmm. um, is many things. Um, but of course, it also fits inside the frame of a house, of a domestic life, of a mm. body, mm. Um, and the forms of um, resilience, belief, insistence, creativity, um, invincibility that mm. are brought to bear in keeping going. Um, it's, it's miraculous. It is. It is. It is. And what an amazing reading of that, too. There's so many questions about that. Uh, we have three questions, but while we're on this poem, um, someone wants to know the name of the poem. So it's called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Lucille Clifton. Um, you can Google that. You can find that poem just about everywhere. It's even been turned into, uh, you know, art pieces and street poetry uh, oh, yeah. in different places. Um, um, go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to say, um, poets, have, you know, have signified upon this poem in so many different ways. Camila Aisha Moon, our wonderful, mm. um, and now our ancestor, a poet yes. who we lost this fall, um, ha has a book by that title, which is mm -hmm. signifying on the, the work and purpose of, of Clifton and, and bringing something new to, to her sense of, of these stakes. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say, Trapita. Mm -hmm. um, it's a slim memoir. Mm -hmm. It is slim in the way that you know, Christ's words in the Bible are, are few. Mm -hmm. And there's something that, um, you know, people have often talked about Clifton's work. Her poems are brief. Many of them are, are short. Humbly, she would say, well, I have so many children. I write when they're asleep. <laughs> yes, but these yes. are poems that, that come from a genius Mm -hmm. um, and a, a brilliance of, you know, not only poetry, it's not just about art, but it's full of art, but there's something, something high and eternal in her work. Mm -hmm. Um, she spiritual has a lot of, even. Yeah, yes. spiritual, yes. and she has a lot of poems that talk about the proximity for her of the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And, um, so this memoir is like a, a crystallization or a distillation of you know, the epic of, of Black history in this, on this continent, um, as received in the body of a, of a young woman mm -hmm. um, who is in touch with something really yes. big. Yeah, uh, bigger than even imaginable. And I think when you're able to read this, I think you'll understand what Tracy is talking about and what we've been discussing the last 45 minutes. I don't think there's enough words to describe the importance of this 
uh, memoir. I, I don't think there's enough, there's history here, there's storytelling, there's a life well lived and there's no judgment. There's a simple, beautiful telling of a family story um, that's rooted in um, so much power and survival and the fact that they're here, right? That's the word, we're, we're still here, Lou. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm gonna go to a couple of questions that came through uh, here. One of the first ones is from Tammy Reston. Um, so Tracy, first of all, thank you so much. And I'll thank you more in the end. Thank this you. is not even an assignment. This is joy. This is, <laughs> we're talking about this to deal with someone whom I admire um, very much. Um, Tammy would like to know, would you talk about how Clifton uses poetic techniques in generations? And she says, thank you, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's a that's a great question. I feel like every every bit of her prose um, feels like it has the compression and the intention of poetry running through it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I read that that paragraph that felt to me like a a, a small play mm -hmm. that allowed you to see something uh, so sort of central to the nature of history and the nature of power in this country and the lie that props it up. Um, she also does really amazing things with time. Mm -hmm. And so this is a this is a memoir that's written episodically. There's there'll be a, a person who marks a generation, and then there'll be like a few sections um, that sit beneath that person's name. And what I love is that it's, in some ways her father's voice helps us to move in and out of time. The present tense of this book is going to the funeral to bury. Clifton's father. Yes. Um, and that is a story that runs through the book, but it's punctuated by the moments when his voice comes back to her. And mm -hmm. she's in the presence, not only of him, but these other family members um, who he brings to life for her. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes a way of leaping around through time in the book. That feels very poetic to me, the way that a poem yes. um, can lift off from one place and take you to the other place that's not chronologically connected, but that's mm -hmm. psychically or thematically relevant to, to where we are. Um, that happens. Um, what else? What would you? How would? What would you add to that, Trapita? Because this is this feels yeah, like. Yeah, I think the rhythm. You had mentioned it in your introduction. Um, the it's the rhythm, and she does it even in her short poems and all of her works that she has. To me, this read very much like poetry. Mm -hmm. visual, uh, the imagery. Um, these were the things that carried me through the story. You mentioned about the ride and them cackling and laughing through the ignorance on this road. And I'm seeing a poem unfold on that road. I'm seeing the look on the woman's face. Um, so I think imagery, um, the, the language, the movement, the rhythm of these, uh, all those things are the poetic techniques that I think she used really well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a prayer, there's a, there's a song-like character, ca characteristics to some of the writing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that she says, I think she used her herself to write these poems, mm -hmm. to write, I said poems, <laughs> to write this memoir. And what she is, is a genius and a poet. And I love that you said genius because her grandmother called her that all the time, yeah. you know, and I, and I felt, you know, really, uh, worn by that, that someone called her a genius like that and as a young woman. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, CK uh, Tasman wanted to know, um, she, uh, she says, I, Tracy, I've read you studied with Lucille Clifton. Would you talk about how her writing influences yours and maybe a favorite story and or word of wisdom about writing from Lucille Clifton with mm -hmm. gratitude? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I feel so fortunate. Oh, I studied wow. with Lucille Clifton my first semester as a grad student at Columbia mm -hmm. in the MFA program. And I was, you know, 23 and largely lost. Mm -hmm. I was also still in grief. My mother had passed the year before. Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, hoping that this would help me to keep moving forward in life. And I got into her workshop and one of the first things I remember her doing was being really honest about the deaths that she had been shaped by her husband, um, a child mm -hmm. and her mother. And she talked about how 
she had conversations with these people mm. and the, the same meditative space in which a poem can emerge for her was a space where listening and dialogue became possible. Mm. And I felt like, I don't know how I will ever do that, but this is what I want to do somehow. I want, I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to be in the world um, in the way that, that Lucille Clifton is. Be wow. living without fear and in touch with these other layers of reality. Mm. Um, she told us stories about um, conversations that she had with the ones with these these non-human spirit voices who had insistent messages and some of that comes out in her um in her poems uh the light that came to lucille clifton mm -hmm. and then she published a sequence that feels to me having heard those stories like transcriptions or distillations of those encounters mm -hmm. in the last book she published mercy yes, under the title yes. the message from the ones yes. received in the 19, late 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, and those are messages for mankind that wow. um, actually are messages for mankind mm -hmm. <laughs> and are actually um, overwhelming poems. But I can see the influences even in your work on Elis Duende um, and these different uh, themes that have, well, I wouldn't say influences necessarily, but there's certainly a connection you know this in that spiritual realm in that idea that you know there are forces larger or different than ourselves that are that that present themselves in our lives and in our writing mm -hmm. so i can definitely feel that um and someone's asking a question about tony morrison's friendship to clifton and her career now we know that tony morrison as a prolific of a writer and, and a genius of a writer as, as, as Toni Morrison was, is uh, we also know that she published and made it possible for a lot of African-American writers, particularly women writers to be published and um, to become published and opened the doors for them when she was an editor. So mm -hmm. someone's asking um, about the importance of friendship uh, her friendship with Clifton. Do you have any information about that you, you want to share? Well, Toni Morrison wrote the introduction for um, the collected poems of Lucille Clifton, which came, uh, it's her work from 1965 to 2010. And so she talks about working with her. Um, I believe, did she edit, um, did she edit this book? I should know I, that. She part. did, I believe so, yes. Yeah, um, so she uh, talks yeah. about that. Yes. She mm -hmm. also talks about the frustration that she feels uh, or felt at the way that Clifton was often described um, mm. by other poets who didn't, didn't acknowledge and maybe weren't equipped to see because of what they might have been looking for in poems mm. about Black life and that often adopt the Black vernacular, didn't see the deep searing intelligence and critique that runs through those poems. Um, you know, the way that you might put a bubble around something and say, oh, that's about them. Mm -hmm. When in reality, you're right there. You're right at the center of it. Um, and so she talks about that. It's a really, I think it's a, a really useful um, essay because of the way that it talks about that editorial relationship and then also this ongoing sense of the of the enduring value of this work and how it has been misread in many ways. Yeah, I, I really appreciate Toni Morrison for that. And I appreciate that that sisterhood in a mm -hmm. sense, because I do think there were times in uh, Lucille Clifton's career where I don't think her value, uh, her contribution as a writer had really been, um, yeah. you know, have really been put out there. Only like, I would say recent years that many people have kind of taken it on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I agree with Morrison. And then as we kind of move into our last question, Mindy Shapiro is writing, um, just she went to high school with two of Clifton's daughters, mm -hmm. um, Frederica who died young and Sydney who was a few years older. And she remember Lucille coming, she said, I remember Lucille coming to my high school to read. I always, it always left an impression. I was thrilled to learn that Sydney raised funds to buy back the family home to open a residency for African-American writers. So what impact do you think this will have on her legacy? And I want to just tell the audience that is that 
uh, Writer's House is located in Baltimore. And um, I and it's a whole story around that that we don't have a lot of time to tell. But I want that was my to question answer. for you in a way. Maybe I can <laughs> tie it into this yes. because you have written about the this reacquisition of this house, and yes, yes. I wanted to know. And you spoke with with um, some of Clifton's children. Um, I wanted to know how that connects back to you to this story. How that experience, um, you know, her legacy essentially. Mm -hmm. um connects back or, or inflects your reading of, of generations if that makes if that makes sense yeah, yeah yes no so for me it's it adds another layer I am really a serious um I don't want to say student I I, I think it's um it, it, I I believe that as black writers as black women writers mm -hmm. I really do believe that we have when we have the ability to shine a light and to, to continue to lift up, to help. I don't want to say carry a legacy, but tow part of it to wherever you need to tow. I think that that's essential. So for me, it's major. Um, the story around her daughter, I didn't have, a, I just only had an opportunity to um, learn about the house. And this house was purchased back. Um, it was actually lost in foreclosure um, many years ago when Lucille Clifton was still with her husband. And her daughter, I, I read, um, works for the Jim Henson Puppet Company, uh, and she was able to buy back this family home. Now, this all happened right as the pandemic began, um, but her, her hope. So for me, the impact um, to be able to be among her things is one of my favorite phrases um, that I use a lot for a writer. Um, mm -hmm. These things, what, what are they going to, what, what, what are the choices that are uh, involved with what you show about a writer's life, what you choose the public to see, because a lot of our lifestyles are so internal, right? <laughs> so yeah. what do you, you know, is it, you know, what do you choose for people to see? So I think it's major. Um, I think this book, um, I really encourage, I, I know Andy put the information in the in the in the chat. I really encourage people to get this book, really, if you are someone who appreciates poetry, if you appreciate the work of Lucille Clifton and Tracy K. Smith. Um, but if you, I really encourage you to get this book because we're talking about legacy here and, and it's here, you know, um, and it comes in many forms. Mm -hmm. um, so we're about to close. So Tracy, thank you. Any last words, any um, thing you want to um, add? It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, likewise. Um, I, I would say this book teaches me something about holding what I descend from and what I claim. You know, it teaches me something about holding it and um, using it. And I feel like that's, that's a real gift. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I'm seeing something in here. And, I, and, and your gift, your love of Lucille um, Clifton and to be able to share with the rest of us through your writing is just amazing. So thank you, uh, everyone. Ed is saying wonderful talk. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and stay safe. And get the book, Generations, Lucille Clifton, Introduction by Tracy K. Smith. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening. Tracy, thank you. It was a pleasure oh, to speak with you. you. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye.